Hello, my name is Allison Warner and I am the Chief Editor of Orthodontic Products. In our continuing series, we are looking at how COVID-19 is affecting the orthodontic practice. Today we are talking to Scott Hansen, founder and CEO of Black Bison Group, a practice growth consulting firm focused on orthodontic practices. His firm recently released a guide for orthodontic practices managing the impact of COVID-19. The document provides a host of measures orthodontists can take to pre protect their practice's financial future. We at Orthodontic Products wanted to talk to Scott to find out more about what practices should be doing right now. Scott, thank you for joining me today. Thanks, Allison. Pleasure to be here. Great. Well, let's get started. You advise doctors in the document to stress test their practices. Why should they do this and what does this look like? Sure. So I've spent a lot of uh, a lot of my time. I grew an orthodontic practice and sold it to small doctors and then um, grew a chat business and sold it to another private equity firm. So I've spent some time with these really smart private equity folks. And um, I got a, a document from uh, from a private equity firm that I have investments with that was a letter out to their uh, to their portfolio companies. And it talked about the importance of stress testing your business. And I thought it was really smart and something that I hadn't seen uh, in, I hadn't seen discussed in the orthodontic world. And the really what it boils down to is we need to be looking at what the worst case scenario is, because if we are preparing for the worst case scenario, we are leaving ourselves as many options on the table as possible. Whereas if we are less aggressive with our reaction to uh, the current events. We use up cash and we use up other resources and other options that we might have had um, if, you know, alternatively we took decisive action right now. Uh, and then stress testing your practice is really looking at what the worst case scenario would be. So it's easy to say, let's prepare for the worst case scenario, but, um, to actually put some math to it uh, so that we can make educated business decisions around um, the decisions that we're making. So uh, for instance, I suggest that practices assume a 90% reduction in patient starts over the next two months. Well, that's pretty easy to understand. Assuming that you're doing virtual consultations, you're not gonna have as many patients start as you otherwise would if your doors were open and um, it was last year this time. Uh, right. And so, you know, maybe we see one out of 10 starts that we otherwise would have uh, with our virtual consultations. And then moving forward, it's not like we're going to, when this is over, who knows when it's over, but when it does start to die down, we have, you know, some economists are predicting 25%, 30% unemployment. And so it's not like we're going to just be able to pick right back up uh, where we left off in February. Um, so, and that's why I'm suggesting a 50%, assume a 50% reduction in patient starts uh, starting in June. And in some in some states, they should even stretch that out farther. Uh, they should have the 90% reduction through June because they've been asked to close their offices through June. So this is not a hard and fast rule, but it's important to think about what are the economic implications of our patients and their ability to come in or their, their uh, desire to come in and start orthodontic care not just over the next two months, but over the next year, maybe year and a half. Okay. Well, once doctors finish this stress test, you recommend practices pull down the entire line of credit now rather than later. Why do you recommend this? Yeah, so we saw this during the 2008 recession. Uh, banks have the ability to limit access to your line of credit. Um, and so it's important that we are generating generating maybe the wrong word but we are creating as much cash uh, that we can right now to give ourselves the biggest pad we can moving forward and we don't want to wait around and have banks tighten up the restrictions on our lines of credit before we have a chance to access them because it could be that we don't need that cash um, until maybe two or three months passes mm -hmm. but if in that time banks have tightened down their restrictions on how we use our line of credit or how much access we have to it, when we need it, we might not have it. And so if we pull it all down right now, the cost of the interest paid over that two or three months, even if we don't necessarily need the cash today, is paltry in comparison to the risk of not having it later. Okay. 
Well, let's also talk about existing liabilities because you discussed that in the guide. You recommend practices proactively contact existing liability holders, so from property management to key vendors. You say do it now, not later. Why and what should that conversation look like? Sure. So the it's important that we're sharing the bad news with um, with our lenders and with people that who we owe. Um, this is not obviously not a surprise to any of these people, and they want to have long term a, a solid long term relationship with our businesses in the long term. Uh, and so we need to share with them exactly what's going on so that we can ask for grace and. The reason why we want to do it now is because the more grace they offer businesses, the harder it's going to be to offer that grace. And so we want to make sure that we are front in line for um, for the flexibility that they have to offer, uh, because over time it will just be more difficult for businesses to offer flexibility because they have liabilities of their own. So, um, you know, we're talking about things like your mortgage. You can reach out and ask for um delay your payments for 90 days and uh, you know roll those payments into the remainder of the loan um, there's all kinds of stuff you can do delay your lease payments I mean when we think about uh, our landlords and uh, their um, you know their motivation they want us to be there they can't go and find a new tenant right now and so they're incented to be flexible with us so that uh, we're there, you know, when this all shakes out. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's a ton of different things that we can do. Reach out to our credit card uh, holders, reach out to anybody who we have an accounts payable, uh, in all of our accounts payable. So lab, clinical products, IT services, HR services, all of those people are going to be flex or are likely going to be flexible with us right now. Um, if we wait two or three months until we're in real trouble because our cash is depleted, we're not seeing as many starts. Um, you know, we don't want to wait for all the dominoes to fall before we start actually planning for worst case scenario. So, what should doctors be communicating to their staff at this point? Yeah, so staff, staff are likely staff members are likely very scared right now. Um, it's a scary time for a lot of people, especially small business owners, um, but we need to be transparent with our staff. We need to tell them exactly where we're at. We need to share the bad news with them as well. The situation we don't want to find ourselves in is that we are overly optimistic with our staff, and then they're surprised down the road that we have to make difficult decisions and staffing changes because of the situation that we find ourselves in. So to be transparent um, benefits us because we um, we don't have to be living two different lives when we're around our team. And it helps them, I think, kind of kick into high gear. Um, they know that times are going to be difficult. And so they're going to be doing everything they can to help right the ship and help uh, in any way that they can. In addition, when we're transparent with our staff, they understand when we're talking about stretching out hours or doing things that are important to get us over the hump over the next few months um, they're not they're not worried that their job is just going to magically go away they know that you will you're going to be honest with them about the actual real case scenario today um, and you know that's important for staff. We we have an obligation to to those people just like we do our patients. But you know with our staff, we're in some sense responsible to help put food on their table. And luckily we have you know these stimulus packages that have been passed that are providing uh, some relief to orthodontic practices. Um, and so the guide that I wrote um, was not inclusive of the Paycheck Protection Program. But that is a, an, an awesome piece of legislation that got passed that doctors should be taking advantage of. And today is April 3rd, and this is the first day that the loan applications are open. But that allows doctors to have um, essentially eight, eight to ten weeks, two and a half months of payroll um, covered from the federal government if they apply soon. So the 
I think the funding is capped at $349 billion. And so you want to get in line soon for, for that cash. And that loan is totally forgiven uh, as long as you meet the requirements over the next few months. So, uh, you know, luckily we do have some things that are going to help us get over the hump, um, but that doesn't mean that we should not be transparent with our staff still. Okay. One of the things you make clear in the guide you put out is that if doctors wait for all the information to make the perfect decision, they could be setting up their practice for even harder times ahead. What do you mean by this? I think this is this is one of the most challenging things for doctors and physicians mm -hmm. to do. Um, they're trained, especially orthodontists. You know, orthodontists are trained to focus on millimeters or fractions of a millimeter. And so they're very detail oriented. And one of the greatest challenges that we see when we do our growth consulting for practices is practices wanna wait until they have a perfect system before they launch, whether that's doing same day starts or doing virtual consults or whatever it is, they wanna make sure all the T's are crossed and I's are dotted before they start. And in some ways, when they're doing orthodontic treatment, that matters a lot. Um, mm -hmm. When they're trying to implement, especially rapidly implement new business solutions, it's a very, uh, it's a, it's the wrong approach because the reality is you can launch virtual consultations that are 80 or 90% to, uh, to perfection. And you might be able to get five or 10 starts over the next couple of weeks, or you can wait until it's hundred percent perfect because you keep editing the scripting and editing the exact process before you launch and you miss out on all of that potential revenue because you're sitting around trying to make the system perfect. And if you had, if you launched a perfect system, maybe you would have gotten 11 starts instead of 10, but it's not worth the cost of not launching it. And the way I would suggest that people think about it, especially during these times is build the plane while you're flying it. So start flying the plane and build it as you go, uh, because mm -hmm. people are going to offer you a lot more grace right now than they would in any other scenario. And okay. there's, there's, tons of successful cases of people launching virtual consults and having multiple starts the next day, people signing mm -hmm. contracts and sending down payments. So it totally is possible to do, to launch something like virtual consults in one day. Okay. Okay. So we've talked about taking stock and getting a hand on where the practice is and where it could be. Now let's talk a little bit about practice, how practices can soften the blow. What should they be doing to generate revenue during the stay at home orders? Sure, so one of the things that we just mentioned was uh, virtual consults. Uh, that is super important. I think before COVID-19, virtual consults were a novelty. They were something, it was kind of fun to have. Patients didn't really use it very much, but we're at a point now where Patients have two options in most states. They can either not make any progress on starting orthodontic care, or they can do a virtual consult. And those are the two options. And so uh, not only is that our only option in many states to generate new revenue for the practice, but this era of people staying at home and spending time on the internet that and buying things through the internet that they've never bought through the internet before, like groceries and getting on video conferences like this, it's going to change the nature of consumer behavior moving forward. Right. People in the future, after this is all settled, uh, they're going to be a lot more comfortable paying for braces online without, without ever coming into the office. And so yeah. what was a novelty is going to be a core part of most orthodontists new patient business moving forward so it benefits you both right now in the immediate term but also in the future because our patients are just going to change yeah um can you talk a little bit about what staff could maybe be doing to help generate revenue beyond um the virtual consult aspect sure i think it's very important that we are ultra responsive to our digital communication. So when people are sending us emails or texting us or whatever, we need to be really responsive to those people. In addition, we need to make sure we're answering our phones. So one piece of terrible advice um, that, uh, that I've seen is the doctor should just close for, you know, two weeks or close for however long it says that, uh, 
you know, whether it's through the end of May or whatever, just close your doors. That is bad, bad advice. Mm -hmm. um, we still have patients that we need to take care of. We still have staff we need to take care of. And there's a lot of work that can be done. Um, mm -hmm. And there's a lot of ways that we can modulate our service to, um, to fit into these crazy times. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's really important that we answer our phone and stretch out our staffing. It's a way that we can continue to pay staff to do productive work. So we're still gonna have patients call the office and we yeah. still might have patients calling us that are interested in new treatment and we can direct them to a virtual consult and get them set up. Uh, and we've done studies on how much answering the phone is actually worth. And these are, this is obviously in, um, in normal times, but right. about one out of 20 calls is going to be a new patient. And when you adjust for case acceptance, that means each one of those calls is worth about 180 bucks. And so it makes absolutely no sense to not answer the phone and just close the doors. Um, you want to appear to be as open as you possibly can be um, for however long this lasts. Yeah. What should uh, staff be doing or doctors be doing in terms of recall patients or patients who don't currently have something scheduled? Yeah, so this is this is a this is one of those processes that we sh already should have mastered in the practice, but many practices don't. But this is a perfect opportunity to implement a process that can last us and pay dividends well into the future. So one huge asset that most practices have, any practices that have been in business for longer than a few years, they have this big chunk of patients that called to schedule an exam and never showed up, called and scheduled an exam, showed up and didn't start, or are in the growth and development or recall process and don't have a future appointment scheduled. And in most practices, the those people just kind of float and there's no special attention paid to those people, but it's a huge potential revenue source. And so right now we can actually go back, generate reports for all those people and call them. We have the time right now to call them. And so we just jump on the phone and call them and schedule them for this summer. So, I mean, who knows when this all dies down a little bit, but I'm anticipating June or July people start to feel a little bit more sense of normal. And so we can just go ahead and proactively schedule those patients into June and July. And whenever we get back to the office, we're stacking the deck for ourselves in terms of generating revenue instead of crossing our fingers and hoping for the best. Okay. Why is it in the document, you talk about it being important to counter pa uh, patients' perception that their case is not making progress during this crisis. What should practices be doing to counter that perception? And what is the sure, danger so, of letting that perception stand? Yeah, so in in the document, when we talk about stress testing the practice, I talk about uh, a reduction in accounts receivable. So something that we, maybe doctors that didn't go through the 2008 recession uh, don't realize is that insurance can delay their payment to you and tell you that they're processing the claim and spend a month or two longer than they otherwise would have to uh, process a claim and pay on it. Patients, you know, some patients, a lot of our patients, probably their parents are going to lose their jobs or they're going to lose their jobs and they're going to be calling us and asking us for grace. And so I assumed a 10% reduction in accounts receivable over the short term. Mm -hmm. uh, and that will that would be compounded if we just shut the doors and stop communicating with our patients because in some patients minds i'm assuming that no progress no appointments equals no progress on treatment and if there's no progress on treatment why are they paying mm. and so we we want to uh we want to stop that perception before it starts and so we can with any kind of texting platform. They, they've eased the HIPAA restrictions right now. I mean, well, I really like Rhinogram as a platform, but they've eased the HIPAA restrictions. So you can basically use any kind of texting platform, but to mm -hmm. send out an email to all your patients and say, hey, if you are reg regularly scheduled on one of these days that uh, we're not seeing patients in the office, send us a set of pictures. And in the guide, I have uh, a form email to send out to everybody, but essentially mm -hmm. we want the, our assistants and the doctors to continue looking over the cases and making the patients feel as though there is still progress uh, being made. And I, and I should go farther. Hmm. There is progress. Like in most orthodontic cases, 
um, you know, they don't necessarily have to be seen back in six weeks. They could right. go eight weeks and the wires still continue to work. And we need to make sure that our patients understand that. And in that form email, um, that's what we tried to create the perception that stuff hasn't stopped. It's just a little bit different than normal. And so here's how we're going to respond to it. Okay. Going back to staff for a second. Um, what could practice, what actions should practices be taking now in terms of their staff? How should they be utilizing them? Or how should they, how should they be handling staffing period? <laughs> sure. Uh, it's changed a little bit with the payroll protection program. Right. Um, but really, and, and we should be thinking about this on a normal day uh, anyway. We need to be using our staff as much as possible to produce revenue for the practice. We need to be, we need our staff to be value added. Now there's certainly other, there are certainly roles in the office that don't directly produce revenue, but we need to be thinking about the productivity of our team and the actions that they're taking when we're paying them. So for instance, if we're paying them to call recall patients that don't have a future appointment scheduled, we are they are doing work that is productive for the practice. And so especially when we don't have patients coming in that have already signed contracts that we are you know, continuing treatment for, if we're going to continue to pay those staff to come into the office and work, we need to be thinking about what sorts of activities they can do to stack the deck for us whenever we get back to uh, you know, a sense of normal. And so calling recall patients, revamping, any of the processes around sales and marketing, uh, making sure that when the practice opens back up for business like normal, that everything is stronger than it used to be. Because the reality is there's gonna be a lot of opportunity on the backside of this. We don't know if that opportunity is going to be in four months or 18 months. We don't know how long it's gonna last, but there will be a pent up demand for orthodontic care and if we use this break as an opportunity to make all of our systems stronger, especially as it relates to sales and marketing, uh, which is what we work with our clients on, we are going to be much better prepared to take advantage of that demand down the road. And that really should be our focus. And I will say, thinking about long term, mm -hmm. if we design, if we use our staff's time to design great processes around these virtual appointments, I imagine that we can increase our margins moving forward by continuing some of these retainer checks and other appliance checks virtually as opposed to having the patients come into the office. Mm -hmm. um, that's a significant long-term win from this if we can change the way we deliver the service to where doctor's happy, patient's happy, but it took us four minutes instead of 30 minutes in the office. So way reduces our costs to uh, let these virtual appointments stick for the appointments that it makes sense. Right. Great. Well, I think all this has been really informative and I get, think it gives doctors much food for thought. If you would like to access the Black Bison Group COVID-19 guide, visit the company's blog on their website, blackbisongroup.com. Scott, thank you so much for speaking with me today. I appreciate it. Thanks, I'd Allison. like to remind our viewers to visit orthodontic products for the latest industry news and until next time stay safe.